here today is uh, Steve Nelson, and he's here with his wife, Gina. St Steve started Stratum Real Estate. Raise your hand if you've seen a Stratum Real Estate sign around. It's, uh, most people have seen Stratum Real Estate. He started in 2010 uh, with three agents um, and uh, operating out of Cedar City. They now have offices in Cedar City, St. George, Duck Creek, and the Wasatch Front um, with more than 50 agents. Um, working for them. Uh, Steve personally owns two hotels, the El Rey and the Stratford Court here in town. Um, and, so, and so you're probably wondering what does he do in his spare time? And so here's the answer. He uh, is on the board of directors of, for the local Realtors Association. He's the founding member of the GPA Charter School. He's a Lions Club board member, a chairman of the Cedar City Downtown Economic Committee, um, and he's on the executive committee of Cedar City's local soccer club, and he's also a soccer coach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's outstanding. Um, this is, uh, let me read something from their website, which, uh, which says, Stratum Real Estate is focused on building relationships founded on honesty and integrity. Um, people always come before money uh, at, at Stratum Real Estate, and I, I know, <clears throat> Of anybody I know, nobody lives up to that ideal better than our guest today. Uh, please welcome Steve Nelson. Thank you, Tyler. I'll, so tell me if I don't talk loud enough. Sometimes people say my voice doesn't carry, but I also don't love podiums. So, um, so maybe I'll give you, to start, a little bit more background just about my life story, I guess, of where, where I came from and, uh, and how on earth I ended where I am, I still don't know. But um, So I, I was raised in Cedar City, uh, born and raised here. I, growing up and as I graduated high school, I was determined that I was going to be a high school teacher. Um, I had been impacted by, by a few teachers that had made a big difference in my life, and I wanted to do that same thing, so I was going to teach school. Uh, I then went and, and served a, a, an LDS church mission, and, and my last, my mission president as I was leaving the mission was a venture capitalist. He, he'd taken three pu companies public, um, he was just incredible with, with money and finance and a definite entrepreneur. My exit interview with him, and you'd think from a church leader it would have been all about church stuff, right? Go home and be righteous and get married and, you know, those things. He spent two hours just talking to me about money. Um, and I, I uh, on that 18 hour plane ride back from Australia is where I was at, I filled my journal with these, these goals. He inspired me financially, right? And I, and I filled my, my journal with goals of, I was gonna be financially independent by the time I was, I was 30 years old. And I was, I mean, I had this, this plan of what I was gonna accomplish. And then I came back and I was gonna go and get a, a business degree. And I took an accounting class and I went back to teaching. <laughs> so I, I ended up graduating and teaching high school. Um, and I, as I was teaching, I grew up doing construction from when I was about 14 and put myself through college uh, working in construction. And so when I was uh, teaching, I would find houses that were old beaters and I'd go and fix them up and, and either keep them as rentals or, or sell them. And, uh, and my wife was also uh, teaching school, and when we had our first kid, she, um, I guess really we decided together that uh, she wanted to stay home and, and, and raise our kids rather than, than have to work. So we taught, uh, I taught one year after that and lived on the one income of a teacher's salary and realized that that wasn't the, couldn't get me to my financial goals very fast. So um, so that stage we'd been, uh, dabbling in real estate and had bought a few in homes that we'd kept as rentals and and so real estate was a natural thing for me to try and that was kind of scary right going from a very secure job to something that is a hundred percent commission based and uh, I remember <laughs> my wife would ask me every day when I came home about <laughs> what deals I was working on what contracts I had because she was way more stressed than me about money um, she doesn't ask me anymore, but, uh, but for a long time there she did. And I, I was just super blessed and, and uh, was able to do well in real estate and, 
And uh, about three years in, I got my broker's license and, and started a little independent brokerage. It was basically just me and my, and I had a, a partner in my sales business, um, Jen Wilkinson's her name. And, uh, and then a couple years after that, I had a couple other guys that were also running independent brokerages approach me and, and want to merge really just for cost sharing is the, the vision of all that we were doing is why I'll pay, you know, insurance and rent and, and the cost of, of running a business. So we're just going to share those costs and do our own thing. And that just developed from there to where we now are the largest real estate company in Cedar and are oh, trying to open branches and expand uh, throughout the state. So, um, so that's kind of a little bit of background, I guess, on where I came from and, and, and where I'm at. Um, about six years ago, we also got really crazy and decided we wanted to buy commercial properties. and. And we, uh, we bought a couple of hotels. We actually own the, about six and a half acres right on the corner center in Maine. So where Park Place Eatery is, Cedar Sports, um, CrossFit, all those buildings right there, um, up through the, Ho the El Rey Hotel, that whole six and a half acres we, we own um, as well. So, so that's, that's been another entrepreneurial adventure that I, again, did not have in my plans. I didn't go to a, um, a club and come up with an idea and go pitch it anywhere, this all just kind of happened. So for me, it's maybe a little of a different approach than some entrepreneurs that, that you'll get uh, have speak to you. Mine organically just happened. It was not an intentional thing that I decided I was gonna own a real estate company and that was my goal or that I wanted to, to own downtown uh, commercial properties. That was just something that it, it just has happened. So my what I wanna share with you today is more maybe of a reflective, um, approach to what I feel like has made me successful as an entrepreneur. Um, that those of you that that's for sure what you know you want to do, hopefully you can apply these principles in a way that can help you to also be successful. So I, I boiled it down to that I think there's three things that I look in and, and I can attribute my success to. Um, the first one I think is um, paramount. You can be have nothing else, and I think you can see this even in society, but if you have one, one ability um, to work hard, you can be successful in anything you do. Um, when I, um, my mom and dad, I'm, hmm, I'm grateful for this one thing that they taught me. He didn't teach me anything about money. He was actually a finance um, degree as a banker. And I think the only thing that he taught me about money was how to take out loans, <laughs> how to go into debt. Um, that's, that's about the extent of his, his understanding. Um, but he did teach me how to work. From when I was literally like five years old, my parents didn't pay for anything but shoes and underwear. <laughs> I had to buy everything else, my own school clothes, if I wanted to participate in extracurricular activities, um, anything I wanted to do, if I, uh, I had to pay for. And they helped me find job opportunities, right? So I, they managed a little clothing store and I, we would go in and put uh, stickers for prices on clothes. And, and, uh, and, and then as I got a little older, he helped me get a job with a contractor and I, and I worked construction. Um, so he helped me find opportunities to work, but that was just a, a part of our family culture was that you know how to work. And I really attribute a whole lot of my success to that. I didn't, I didn't buy my first house and hire anybody to do the work. I literally gutted that house down to the brick exterior walls and the roof were all that were left on it and did it brand new all myself after teaching school. So I'd go and work teaching, I'd coach, then I'd go home and I'd work on that house until 11 o'clock at night. And I'd get back up and do it again the same the next day. Um, so hard work, is I think the most paramount principle of any entrepreneur. There's not a free ride, there's no easy lunch for you to, to get in, if you're gonna be an entrepreneur. You have to be committed to working harder than anybody else to be successful. Um, so that's number one principle. Um, number two is I view, um, you know, I, I, went to, I wanted to be a school teacher, right? So my heart's desire was always to try to help, to serve. And I believe that regardless of what you do as a profession, um, and what your business idea is that you want to grow as a business, I believe that you have to have a, an element of what you're doing is because you want to provide service to other people. And whether that's a product that you believe will bless people's lives and make their lives easier or better, 
the motivation of that in order for it to be successful is that you, you go really want to help people with that product, not sell them a bill of goods that doesn't actually work or, or help them, but actually bless their lives, make their lives better. If it's a service industry of some kind, that's obvious, right? You have to care about people um, and have a desire to serve in what you do. And I'll just share a couple uh, maybe stories um, as I talk about these, but one of the ones that's been fun for me, especially since we've, we've bought the hotels, um, is I don't look at my work day as, as just business, right? I look at everybody that I interact with as, is there an opportunity for me to, to make an impact in their life, right? So we had, uh, there was one day where our, our um, head housekeeper had quit, and, uh, and so I was actually going in and, uh, and doing the, the housekeeping assignments every day. So I'd go in in the morning and make the housekeeping assignments and was kind of running the housekeeping department until we found somebody. And there was an applicant that I, that I interviewed that was fresh out of jail. Um, she, uh, um, and so most people wouldn't hire, right? She'd been, literally, she was a convict and, and did not have a good work history or background. There was nothing that an employer would look at and say, man, that's going to be a great employee. Um, but I felt a sincerity from her and a desire to, to change her life. And, uh, and so I took a chance on her and I hired her. And, uh, and she actually um, has become my head housekeeper now at the hotel. And she's completely turned her life around um, because uh, somebody looked and tried to help her, to care about her. Um, so, and, and uh, that in turn has created an employee for me that would jump in front of a bus um, if that's what I asked her to do. She's so grateful because I cared about her that she works her guts out for me. Um, and so if I just treated it just like a, a business attitude in the way that I approached my business, you don't develop those same kind of relationships with people, that same kind of loyalty that people give you. Um, so I, uh, that, that idea of, of really trying to serve in whatever it is that you do, I think can bless your life and, and bless countless other people's lives. Um, I, I try to approach it the same way in my real estate business. So um, because of my background, there's been lots of deals where um, an inspection item comes up, like let's say a roof needs to be replaced in order to get an FHA loan on it and my seller does not have the money to be able to replace a roof. Um, so I've, I've done this actually a couple times on roofs where that Saturday I go buy the materials and I go roof their house um, so that they can get their deal closed. Um, and there's those types of things uh, that I just approach of how I can always help in what I do um, is, a, is I think a key part to success in business. Uh, the third one that I, uh, that I feel is very important is people have to trust you. Above all else, people have to know that you will always do the right thing. Regardless of money, regardless of, of uh, your pride, whatever the, the barrier might be that would cause you to, to be tempted to make a, a decision that isn't the right thing to do, you have to always make the right decision. Put people and principle before money. Um, I, I had uh, early on in my career, it was probably, probably within the first year or so of me getting into real estate. I helped this client that was looking to buy um, a home that, that had a detached garage that wasn't finished, but it had plumbing to it. And so he wanted to finish that as an apartment, right? And be able to live in the house and rent the, the apartment above the garage. Really smart. Um, so I, through the process, we um, checked out if it was possible, and it was an R2 zone, so it was allowed as a, as a duplex. And after we close, he goes to pull the permit to turn it into a, a duplex. And there was a breezeway attaching the existing house to the garage. And I did not help him research enough about an R2 zone to realize that, that, uh, that it, they, they couldn't be attached in that zone. And the way and the, and the setbacks and stuff for that to happen weren't there, and so um, I viewed that as that was my fault. My job was his advisor, right? My job was to help him make sure as he bought that house, he understood all that was going to be required for him to be able to to purchase that home and do what he wanted to do with that property. 
So um, that was pretty crappy. And I could have just said, we have them all sign a form. Uh, real estate agents have a CYA form called a buyer due diligence form that says it's your responsibility to check out all these things, not mine, right? So I could have just said, dude, that sucks. Sorry, I messed up. Um, but you signed this form. Legally, I'm not obligated to help you. I'm sorry. Um, but I couldn't do that. That's not the right thing. Even though it was legally okay, it wasn't the right thing to do. Um, so $40,000 later, the neighbor sold us an easement of his property um, in order to make it uh, duplexable or to fit the ordinance. Um, had another one where a stupid mistake, um, I helped a client buy a lot up in Ashdown Forest and we got the plat map of it and we looked at the and this was all kind of done remotely with him. He, he didn't, and so I didn't ever actually go with him to the property. Um, and we got the plat map and he looked at it and I looked at it and the street name of what the corner we thought it was was the right one we thought. And we closed on this lot. He goes to pull a building permit on the lot and his builder realizes um, the lot you think you own is over here on this end of the street. You actually bought the lot on this end of the street. So we sold him the wrong lot. <laughs> <clears throat> Again, I could have done the same thing legally. You signed this saying you had to check that out, not me. But uh, instead, I ended up buying a lot. Luckily, this one was still vacant and somebody did want to sell it. So we were able to help him buy the lot that he thought that he wanted. <laughs> um, and then I owned a lot in Ashdown Forest for a little while. Um, so that's those are just a couple of examples of the, those are tough decisions those are big i mean that was a thirty-five thousand dollar lot that i to make it right i felt like i needed to to uh to make it right by him and i bought it um so those those types of uh of examples happen all the time and, and you read on our website the line that i often use on our website is people always come before money doing the right thing it always comes before money um tyler uh, um, harassed me about one I shared with him. Um, it's maybe, I think it falls in the same category, but uh, maybe a little bit different. Uh, when the temple rumors were announced, right, and everybody was talking about that this temple might happen, I'd heard about it pretty early on. And, uh, and there was um, the concept that, hey, if you buy land around the temple, once the temple's announced and built, that property value goes up, right? Um, and, uh, and so, as an investor, which I do a lot of, that thought of, oh, I should go buy some lots. And I, I just couldn't get myself to do it because I didn't feel like capitalizing on something like that was, um, for me personally, that wasn't a, a morally ethical thing to do for me personally. Um, so I, I couldn't get myself to go buy those lots. It's that same kind of principle. It's not looking to take advantage of every situation for money. It's, it's focused on, on what really trying to do the right thing. So, so those are the three things that I feel like you can, you can apply to anything and it will help you to be more successful in whatever business that you do. So um, I wanted to leave plenty of time um, uh, for you to just talk to me and ask me questions and pick my brain about anything you want to pick it for. So fire away. That was all that I wanted to share from a principal standpoint. So anybody have questions for me? You bet. So you, you, you mentioned a couple of times <coughs> That, uh, that you did the right thing by people. I'm thinking of the example of the, the your, your head house, head maid. Yeah. Um, how often has that come back to bite you, and what and, and how is it that you continue? Because I, I can't imagine that your success is 100% in, 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 in those kind of situations. So. Great question. How, how do you decide and... and um, so, so yes, it can. There's, there are people that... Uh, that still are interest more in their self-interest than in doing the right thing. Um, so there have been times, like I had one where I bought a house on a foreclosure and there was a lady in there that uh, um, I really tried to help. Like she, she had a disabled son. She, uh, I think personally, I think she had some mental challenges herself. And I tried to work with her rather than just evicting her and throwing her out on the street, right? Which legally I could do about a three week process and you can have somebody out of a house. Um, I, I tried to help her to find a place to work with her timing and, um, and, it, and it, that bit us. We, we dragged it on, she drugged it on for th three, four months um, before I finally had to just say that I, I gotta have you out. So it does, absolutely it happens, but I, 
the times that that has happened, I still look at the overall um, benefit versus loss. And I think the benefit is always greater than the loss in the big picture, right? Even just the, the fact that, uh, and it's humbling when people make these kind of comments, but I had somebody just the other day that they said they were at a soccer game and were talking to somebody about um, investing. And this person just said, you have to call Steve Nelson. You won't find a more honest real estate agent. And they shared that story when they called me. And that it's really humbling to have people say that kind of stuff. But, but that's what happens, right? If you always make sure you're true to the principles, then the benefit of that comes around a hundredfold to what I might have gained off of taking advantage of that one situation or, or not, not trusting this one person, you know. Um, I think it just always comes back way more than what you might lose by taking that risk. And you have to be smart, right? You don't, don't want to be taken advantage of and you've got to be um, realistic about that there are people that will take advantage of you. But, uh, but I tend to trust before I distrust. So, good question. What else? Um, so, I, for someone who's looking to go into real estate, mm -hmm. um, or into that business, what would you say is like a good first steps? You know what I mean? Like, like how do I go about getting into it? Like how much money you'd say to have like- Kind of in reserve and- Right, right. Yeah, like, well, so obviously that's the scariest part, right? Because if you go into real estate, it is literally 100% commission. So there is no, I can go to work and get a paycheck in two weeks. It's 100, I have to sell something. Um, so the barrier of entry is actually very low. Uh, the average real estate agent makes $26,000 a year, okay? So you, you think about, sometimes you think about real estate as this very lucrative business and there are definitely, the sky is the limit on, that's the cool part about it, of what you can achieve in real estate, but average is $26,000 a year, right? So that means there's a whole lot of people making nothing for to offset or average out the people that are doing really well. Um, so the barrier of entry is literally you, uh, you can get the classwork done. It's 120 hours of, of desk time, seat time that can be even done online. Um, and, you, and your total cost of entry into it is about $2,000 by the time you pay for your classes licensing and join the local association or board. So very low cost of entry and barriers to entry. But the reserve side is, is the hardest part. So I had a little bit of an advantage because I was teaching school and when I got my license. And so I kind of got started and even got paid through August while I was getting going before I ran out of a steady paycheck. Um, so I tell people you really want to plan on having about a three month reserve because even if I put a deal under contract the first day that I have my license, you're 30 to 45 days before it closes and you get paid, right? So really you want to plan on about a three month reserve to be safe to really go into real estate full time. Um, there's a lot of people that try to dabble and do it part time. If you're really thinking of real estate, I would discourage that. Um, it's the idea of uh, I, if I kill what I eat, I'm more likely to kill it if I'm hungry. So if I'm dabbling in it, then I'm still getting fed by something else I'm doing part time. And you never really get the the drive or the commitment to, to go do it. So my advice is you go full bore and just have that reserve saved up when you do it. Great question. What else? Yes. Hey. Um, the question that I have is I know that you have a really good working relationship with your employees. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, like, what expectations do you set up for them? Like, what, do you, what are the conversations that you have with, like, this is what they expect from your employees? Great question. Um, you know, I, I haven't formalized that, so I don't know 100% how to answer that question, Bridget. Um, I, I, I think a lot of the, I think if I were to credit what my relationships with my employees are, it's because they know I care about them. I think that's what a lot of it comes back down to is, it's our human nature is we don't want to betray people that we know love us, right? If, if I've got a jerk as a boss that is just demanding things out of me, but he doesn't really care about me, uh, it's way easier for me to be a jerk back to him and not care about what he wants me to do, right? But, but because I, I do all that I can to make sure my employees know I care about them, 
then I think they naturally reciprocate that and are more likely to do a good job. Um, so that's probably how I would answer that. Because I don't have a formal, like, we go over these things, you know, as an employee, and that's my, my expectations. It's, but they, I, I try really hard to make sure they know I care about them. Good question. Uh, why do you feel motivated to continue to expand your business? Um, <coughs> I wonder how my wife would answer that one. <laughs> So the question was, why am I motivated to continue to expand my business? Uh, so my wife would joke with me that about every five years, I have to do something different. Uh, so that I think I'm just kind of wired that I don't sit very well. Uh, that, that's just me. I, true, right? Yeah, much to her dismay at times, because I, I can't just go home and just hang out like I have to have something planned to do like I'm just kind of wired that way so uh, probably a natural intrinsic more motivation for me um, I do get satisfaction of accomplishing things like the fun of it to me has nothing to do with the financial the money side I mean I am driven I'll, I'll clarify that I guess I am driven to be at a point where I don't have to stress about money that I can just do what I feel inspired to do um, and that's been a drive but uh, but I am pretty comfortable in that area, you know, from a financial standpoint. I think I kind of reached that. For, so for a while, that was it, was um, not wanting to have to worry about money and that I could just get up in the morning and decide what I want to do that day and go do it. Um, but, uh, but now I think it's just more of I enjoy creating things. Like I just enjoy that process. Like my 14-year-old, my, uh, well, he's now 16, but when my boy was 14, he came to me with a, a pedicab business idea, right? And, and uh, it was fun for me to help him kind of start that business, you know, and, and, uh, and he, he may have seen him he does, during the Shakespeare in the summer, he does pedicab rides back and forth between Shakespeare and downtown. Um, so I think it's the, the creative side of it's fun for me, just to, to, to see if I can do it, right? Just the challenge of if I can, can build something. So, good question. What else? Oh, excuse me. For you personally, what is the most challenging thing and the most enjoyable thing about being a business owner? Challenging thing is 100% you're always on call. Like if there's something, you don't get to check out. There is no, it's five o'clock and I get to punch the clock and, and go home, right? That, so that is by far the thing that's been the most challenging is balancing life as a business owner because the reality is, is you still gotta make sure your wife knows that, that she knows I care about her, right? And my kids know that, that I care about them and I spend time with them and don't have the business control my life. Um, and I'll be honest, there was a time that I wasn't very good at it, right? Um, there was, there was a, some, a few years there where I really, really struggled with that balance and how to, um, to, to make sure that the people that were most important felt that they were most important. You know? So that was, that's the most challenging for me by far. Um, the, the most rewarding of it, uh, for me it's been uh, and you can tell because I get emotional about it, but it's the, the, the feeling that I'm helping people is the, it's been most rewarding to me, um, is that I, I really enjoy the, the feeling like I'm, I'm being a benefit in people's lives and, and helping them. So, good question. What else? When you started going full-time, how did you know that you were okay, like successful? You didn't know. <laughs> It is a total gamble. Um, and I think we were still newly enough married that she uh, didn't know how to tell me no. <laughs> kind of like our first house that we bought. She was a little, if she, she wouldn't have bought it if she knew if we had been married longer. Um, yeah, I didn't know. Honestly, I, you kind of, I think for me, uh, th this was the decision point for me. I, I was looking at the reality of my life in that I could continue teaching and make, I think my salary was $24,000 a year when I started teaching and then I coached and got an extra $3,000 for, for being a head coach. Um, so that was, that was the income I was making and I could continue to do that and my thought was, I thought, oh, I'll get a master's degree, then I'll make more, right? So I actually had registered for a master's program, then I went and looked at the pay scale increase that I was going to get 
and I was going to go $10,000 in debt for the student loans to get my master's program, my master's degree, and it would have equated to $1,000 or more in my paycheck a month, or a year, sorry, a year in the beginning. Over time, it would have gotten better. So it was like 10 grand in debt, $1,000 a year income. That's really not a good business decision, right? That was, so I think it kind of, I almost forced myself into that decision from a, a financial standpoint that I had to do something different and that was the the only other thing that felt like we could we could do and that I'd enjoy doing so so sometimes it is almost a there has to be a, a why a, a need to do it um, sometimes to take that jump so you definitely believe in doing a lot of things yourself but when do you kind of take a step back and you're like hey I, I should probably let somebody else do this <laughs> I'm running a large company I can't be you know redoing roofs yeah, good question. I, do I do that yet? No, no I don't. <laughs> Still learning that one. You what? So the question was, I, he said, I obviously do a lot of stuff myself. Um, so what's the point in what, when you realize that you really should just have somebody else go roof the house instead of you go roof the house? Um, it's a good question. Anybody have an idea to teach me that one? Because I, I really still struggle with it. Like the apartment building behind CrossFit, um, if you guys have seen that, that thing. Um, I still have gone, like me and my boys demoed that whole thing, right? Like we ripped it all apart instead of paying somebody to do it. Um, so I haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, I, I guess I do in some ways. Like I, I do make, I enjoy it as part of the problem, right? I, I don't know if it's the way I was raised or what, but I get a lot of satisfaction actually of taking something that's yucky and turning it into something nice and fixing something I, I just enjoy. So that's probably part of the problem for me personally is I get some satisfaction out of it. Um, but I do, uh, I have gotten better like on the, a lot of the flip houses that we do now, I, I hire that out, you know, I just make sure the numbers make sense to be able to pay somebody to do it and, and hire more things out than I used to. Um, part of why I still do some of those things too is I want to teach my boys how to do that work because I, I really look at from I, I tried to calculate it one day because I grew up doing construction and I knew how to do a lot of that stuff I tried to calculate how much money it saved me by being me, me being able to do it and I mean hundreds of thousands of dollars I've made by me being able to do it rather than somebody else now there is a trade-off when you get to a point where Okay, Steve, you really could go sell another house and make 10 grand, or you could spend that same five hours fixing a roof, right? Like, that's kind of stupid from a business standpoint, right? Um, and I'm getting, I'm starting to do that more. I am, right? I haven't touched 200 North at all yet. <laughs> um, would you say that you have stayed the same like, amount of frugal? as you've made more money <laughs> as when you started? <laughs> Tyler, how would you answer that question? <laughs> he was harassing me about this earlier. <laughs> hey, the question was if I stayed as frugal as I've made more money. I'm a, I'm a car guy and possibly a car snob, but I'm always curious what cars are entrepreneurs drive to campus. I always do a once over. Uh, a lot of Land Rovers, uh, Teslas, a lot of nice cars. Uh, we've only had one jalopy uh, late 90s Honda Accord. Civic. Civic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so if that's an answer. <laughs> yeah, those are the guys that see me get in it at the gym. I mean, the bumper's hanging off of it. You know, I had a guy back into me and I never fixed it. Um, so so I, I actually have viewed that as, again, because I'm not driven by money. Um, is I've looked at it as my financial security has been my goal. So I don't care a lot about things. I mean, the house we live in right now is a 1,200 square foot with a, a basement, so 2,400 square feet finished with our four kids out in a, a very a modest neighborhood, right? I, I, I've just never cared about stuff. Um, I get way more fulfillment out of, out of helping people and out of creating things than I get out of stuff. So my wife does like to travel, however, so <laughs> we do do that. <laughs> uh, good question. I actually think that's an important one, right? If you can, if you can figure out how to, in fact, I, I was still uh, in college and I was down at the, the, you know where the creamery is down by the town and country in that uh, depot plaza? 
Um, that used to be a gas station right there. And I was in there in that gas station visiting a friend that worked there. And this guy um, came in to just buy some gas and he saw us kind of chatting and he started talking. You guys are college students and yeah, we're gonna be graduating. And, and uh, this dude, like, it stuck with me. Um, so you never know randomly how you help somebody. But this guy really helped me and he said, he said to me, well, you want me to give you the secret of, of financial success? I was like, oh, this is interesting. Well, let's hear this. Um, he said, when you graduate from college, continue to live like you're in college. Right? Because how much, like really, how much do you guys live on? Like nothing, right? <laughs> I mean, you get by on like $10,000 a year maybe, right? You live really, really cheap while you're in college. So if you can figure out how to, to do that when you graduate, and you're making the 50, 100, whatever you're, you end up doing, and you can continue to live like you were in college, think how far that puts you ahead. If you save all of that money, now let's say five years, and you save $200,000 in five years, think about how, what kind of a jump start that gives you in being able to be an entrepreneur, um, to, to be financially secure, independent. I mean, that's huge if you can just discipline yourself to be, because does stuff really make you happy? No, it doesn't. I promise you it doesn't. There's a reason that uh, movie stars kill themselves and get onto drugs. Because they're really financially successful, but they're not happy. So it does not bring happiness to have stuff. It's okay to have it if you can afford it, but it doesn't make you happy. Great question. What else? What would you say about like, having real estate like, on the side, like, just as like, passive? Everybody should do it. <laughs> Talk to me after I help you find one. No. Um, <laughs> I, I actually am a firm believer in it, right? Like, so I, I have like maybe $40,000 invested in the market, in the stock market. Um, everything else that I have invested in. So I obviously believe in real estate as an investment tool. So even if you don't go into real estate as a profession, I think everybody should own real estate. There's so many tax advantages to it. Um, that and you can do it in a variety of ways. I mean, there's even stuff like self-directed IRAs where you can take money that you've invested in the market and you can buy real estate with that in a self-directed IRA. Um, and if you're not somebody, that, it does take a personality to manage property, right? So if you're somebody that is a total pushover, um, like me, then you gotta make sure you have a spouse that's not. <laughs> so Gina actually has managed our real estate on the rental side um, because she's a, a lot more um, firm with people than I am. Um, and if you don't have that in your skill set, then hire a property manager that will just be firm with renters and make them pay. But as long as you can do that, then uh, I, real estate is a fantastic investment tool. Not, and you can't just buy to buy. So like, like right now, if you actually came to me and said, hey, I want to buy a rental property, I would be very hesitant to help you buy one um, because the market's so high that the, the return on them is just not good. Um, so you'd, and I've actually had a few clients recently that have gone to and used another agent because I was discouraging them to buy. Um, but I remember the market cycle, the worst thing to do is I, to help somebody buy a house at the peak of the market and then four years later you're sitting in their living room and they have to sell and they're upside down and now they have to get foreclosed on or short sale and destroy their credit. All right, so that, that kind of goes back to the same principle of why I feel like I'm successful is I'm honest with people. If, they, if it's not a good time to buy, I tell people it's not a good time to buy um, and make them really want to do it before I'll sell them a house. So, great question. What else? Oh, sorry, Jamie. Okay, so you mentioned your son Caleb's petty capitalism, mm -hmm. but I think this group could really benefit from hearing a little bit more of the details. I know this kind of takes them to the top of the seat just a bit, yeah. but his son's story is actually quite admirable. So would you kind of explain like, how he came to you and what you required? And how yeah, you bet. And you bet. So, the recognition that he's received. Yes, and it's gotten him super excited about business stuff. Like, yeah. he's all into DECA, and he's going to be like, so he was, 
So he was 14 when he came to me and he kind of had heard, so because we own all this downtown property, my wife and I are always talking about, because our dream is we actually bought it all because we want to help Cedar have a vibrant downtown. We want to redevelop it in a way that it's the, a place where university students actually have somewhere to go, you know, and do things. And, um, and tourists have a, this great place so our, we're planning to, over time to redevelop that into a great mixed use project. So Gene and I are always talking about ideas of things we can do down there. And uh, he picked up one day on this idea of pedicabs. I'm just over, overhearing conversations. So I come home from, from work one day, and he has put together a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> about a pedicab business. And uh, what he was going to call it, he picked out a name, and, uh, and, and how it was going to be successful. And I'll be quite honest, I was like, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> I don't believe that's really going to work. Um, and so I tried to put him off by saying, all right, well, if that's something that you, you really think you want to do, you come up with half of the money to buy the pedicabs, and I'll partner with you for the other half. Okay? I figured that would kill it. Because each of those pedicabs is five grand a piece. Okay? Um, so I'm like, I don't, he's a 14-year-old kid. He's not going to be able to go come up with five grand. So a few days later, I come home, and he's got his PowerPoint back open. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he has figured out how he can make the $5,000. He, he designed signs to put on the sides and the back of the pedicabs, and he was going to go sell spot marketing ads on the pedicabs. And lo and behold, he went and got $5,000 worth of sponsors. <laughs> and, and so we drove to Denver, Colorado and bought some pedicabs. Um, so, so that's how he kind of started it. Um, and uh, the first year, he, he made $20 in revenue um, outside of the sponsorships, right? So we had the advertising that was his money into the business. Um, and that's how we view it. I viewed it with him is I'm a business partner with him. Rather than giving him something, he has to earn it, right? He has to work for it. Um, and so um, the first year, he literally made $20 with his 12 employees that he managed and and scheduled and, and pedaled bikes and he just does it for tips is how he does it. Uh, this last year I think he grew it to where he was made in, in profit in rides. So this last year he made $4,000 in profit in the rides. So, so he's done a good job of figuring out what didn't work that first year and what he had to tweak and change and is now, has now uh, turned it into a pretty good little, little business for a now 16 year old kid. So it's kind of fun. And it, just little ideas, right? You never know what the idea can be that can work. But uh, the principles, I think, still applied even for him. He worked hard to do it. Like, it's hard for a 14-year-old kid to go knock business doors and ask for advertising, right? That was not an easy thing for him to do. And, and, uh, and he's, he's the business owner, so somebody doesn't show up to pedal. He's the one going in and pedaling, right? So it, it's been really good, really good for him. So great. Thanks, Jamie, for that. Anything else? You're like, it's time for lunch and let's get out of here. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you guys for having me. I hope it was uh, beneficial in some way. And Before you, we dismiss, uh, I'd like to present Steve with, uh, this is the Cedar Award. Um, it's made from cedar wood. Uh, Not juniper. It, it is. It's, it is juniper. <laughs> it is juniper. <laughs> um, so so please, uh, please thank Steve for, for coming today. Thank you.